Welcome. My name is Marisa Rodriguez and I'm the NAJGA manager. NAJGA or the North American Japanese Garden Association is an organization that's dedicated to connecting and supporting the Japanese garden community. Thanks to support provided by the Japan Foundation, this series inspired by Dr. Kendall Brown's book, Quiet Beauty, will focus on the history and development of Japanese gardens in the US. Today, we continue with part four of this 14 week series, Building Bridges, Friendship Gardens from the Post-War Era. I'd now like to introduce our first speaker, Luan Kanzawa. Luan is the Executive Director of the Japanese Friendship Garden Society of San Diego. Luan's extensive background in nonprofit leadership and management provide direction and support for the Japanese Friendship Gardens board and staff. With a passion for working with nonprofit organizations and her enthusiasm for serving the community, Luan currently serves on the board of the Bobo Park Cultural Partnership and the Bobo Park Committee, as well as on the California Association of Museums' Program Committee. Luan holds a BS in psychology, a certification in professional grant writing, and a master's in nonprofit leadership and management from the University of San Diego. Luan also served as the 2018 to 2019 president of NAJGA. So thank you, Luan, and welcome. Thank you, everyone, um, for being here. Uh, my name, again, is Luan Gonzawa, and um, I've been with the Japanese Friendship Garden for the past 20 years. Just a, a little bit um, introduction about the garden, if you haven't been here. Um, so the Japanese Friendship Garden is located in the um, heart of Babo Park. Um, we always say it's an expression of friendship between San Diego and um, the sister city, Yokohama. Um, so we're surrounded by museums in the park. So there's like the art museum. Uh, and also it's in close proximity to the world's famous San Diego Zoo. So the 1200 acre park um, is considered a cultural district and historical uh, historic landmark uh, in San Diego. So it attracts about 12 to 15 million visitors per year. So you can imagine uh, Bubble Park is a pretty busy park in San Diego. Um, the history about the garden. Um, so similar to the one in Saratoga, uh, our history um, uh, is connected to the uh, 1915 um, Pan American uh, Exposition, uh, the Japanese Tea Pavilion. Um, so the Yokohama Sister City was instrumental in the development of the Japanese Friendship Garden. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the Yokohama and their development and how they were so much involved with the formation of the garden. So after the exposition ended in 1917, um, the Japan Exhibit Association, they gave the building to the city of San Diego, which in turn uh, gave the lease to this uh, family, Asakawa family. So the tea house then when they managed it, it was popular for um, ice cream and, and tea for sailors on payday. Um, the family pretty much ran the tea pavilion until the outbreak of World War II. Uh, around 1945 and 1954, the tea house was closed and left to deteriorate and eventually dismantled to make a room for the new children's zoo. So around 1954, um, uh, a Japanese community leader, his name is Saburo Moroka, visited Yokohama and talked to the mayor, Mayor Hiranuma, and the Yokohama city officials concerning about a friendship gift. So uh, you know the uh, the society, the sister city, they they're known for their gift exchange. So um, the Yokohama city officials decided a stone lantern. So this is a stone lantern here, would represent their desire for friendship. So the lantern is currently located in the San Diego Zoo. Uh, to the left is the the mayor, uh, Mayor Peterson, and uh, the right gentleman is the parks um, commissioner Earl. I just want to highlight these two mayors. Um, they were the main contributors in establishing the sister city relationship between San Diego and Yokohama. So around 1951, the previous mayor before Charles Dale uh, visited um, or attended the um, the mayor, uh, the Japanese American Pacific Coast Mayor's Conference in Tokyo. So he met the mayor there in Yokohama, Mayor Hiranuma. So when, um, so a year later when Mayor Charles Dale became the mayor of San Diego, so he established a sister city relationship between San Diego and Yokohama sister city. So there's a day around 1956 when the Mayor Dale uh, proclaimed the 22nd of October Yokohama Friendship Day and encouraged the San Diego community to uh, support 
an exchange of educational and cultural ideas. So then that started the relationship, right? So between 1951 and 1960, so the San Diego Sister City affiliation with Yokohama grew stronger. So Yokohama became, uh, began making friendly overtures towards San Diego. So the citizens of Yokohama, they presented this friendship bill right here. Um, so that's around 1958. So as part of their centennial celebration of formal relations between the two countries, Japan and US. So it also served as to mark the establishment of the sister city relationship between San Diego and Yokohama, which was the first such affiliation on the West Coast. Um, so then in 1959, the Friendship Commission discussed a proper gift in exchange for the ceremonial gate. So they, they proposed this, uh, they proposed a stone replica statue of the guardian of the water located, if you're from San Diego, it's the one located in front of the San Diego Civic uh, Center. So similar, similar statue was um, donated and placed in um, Yamashita Park in Yokohama. So if you've seen it, they're similar. It's amazing to see that. Um, so then um, 1967, uh, the San Diego Yokohama Friendship Commission, they became their own nonprofit. So they're now called the San Diego Yokohama Sister City Society. So around 1968, Charles Dale Memorial Gate was acquired and dedicated the gate in memory of San Diego Mayor Charles Dale, who passed away in 1968. And this is also a symbolism of, of the entrance to a Japanese garden. So in addition to that, in 1969, they also planted two Monterey pine trees in Babo Park in memory of Charles Dale and the Mayor Ryozo Hiranuma, um, and also um, a Third three, uh, a Japanese black pine was also planted in Balbo Park, symbolizing the unity of two cities. And I'm still looking for that in Balbo Park, so I don't know where it was planted. Um, so then the, the San Diego Yokohama Sister City found an available land in Balbo Park. And so they decided to build a Japanese garden to bring the original 1915 tea garden. So this is what it looks like when they found the land. Uh, this is the Oregon Pavilion. So around 1977, Fong and the La Roca Associates and Professor Takeo Usugi designed the plan for the first phase. So the, um, the plan was unveiled in 1979. And this is pretty interesting because as you can see back then, uh, so they divided the, the development of the garden to five phases, the 11.2 acres. Um, back then, the total cost for the expansion is close to 11.5 million. Comparing to now for our, the lower garden, we spent 15 million, so it's a big difference. So around 1979, the Japanese Friendship Garden Society of San Diego was formed and it was incorporated in 1980 as a 501c3. So that's when the, uh, the Yokohama sister city transferred control of the project to the Japanese Friendship Garden Board. So around 1984, so JFG officially signed a 50 year lease with the city of San Diego for the 11.2 acre line. And at the same time, the JFG received $600,000 from Kyocera. So that was the first significant funding we received at the garden. So several news outlets announced this plan for the Japanese garden. So we were all over the newspaper back then. So around 1984, um, so Professor Mitsuo Yokoyama and um, Ms., uh, Mr. Uh, Landscape Architect Nakajima were selected to implement the master plan. Um, so then around 1985, uh, they hired Kurano Associates uh, to be the project manager. So he was responsible for coordinating the efforts of all parties, as you know, working with the city, the governing agencies, the site engineer, and all, all those responsible parties. Um, around 1987, Mayor Michikazu Saigo wrote a letter to the Sister City Society regarding, regarding the naming of the garden after Sankei Inn in Yokohama. So around 1988, the San Diego city manager recommended financing a 45 million project in Bubble Park improvements through the uh, hotel, uh, hotel occupancy tax. So JFG received 2 million out of that 45 million um, uh, funding. So then now we have the money and everything for the first phase. So July 1989, so JFG held the groundbreaking for phase one. So on the left, that's the program they used during the event, which include the uh, master plan and construction phases. 
So construction, construction began for the first phase so around 1990. Um, Ken um, Nakajima uh, placed the, the rocks in the upper garden. Uh, so these stones were shipped from Japan. Um, we, around 1990, we also received a 4,000 pound sunken entrance stone donated by the Sister City Society that's now placed at the front entrance of the garden. So the calligraphy of the Sankein is a replica of a gift from the late Michikazu Saigo, who, the mayor of Yokohama, who died in uh, 1990. So this is the completion of phase one. So then, so phase one then, um, so they held their first Natsumatsuri um, as part of their fundraiser event. So they were, they had performances um, of, during that year. But around 1997, um, the, uh, the Yokohama Boy Scouts of uh, citizens and citizens of Yokohama donated the, the snow, snow lantern, a bronze uh, yukidoro. Um, and then on the pedestal of the lantern, um, it was written by the uh, mayor Takahide. Um, and then the names of the contributors are stored in, inside the lantern. Then moving forward, going to phase two. 1998 and 1999. Um, so 1994, 1997, so that's when we, uh, JFG selected the, the architectural team. Um, so the, for the building architect, it's Rosalind Nakamura and the landscape architect, Takeo Uzugi. So the garden was closed between 1998 and 1999 during all the construction. And then we reopened in 1999 for the second phase with the front entrance and tea pavilion, the Fujidana and the Koi Pond, the admin building and the activity center. So pretty much the upper garden. Then moving to phase three, uh, around 2001, JFG contracted the same uh, architectural team, uh, Takeo Sugi and Kotaro Nakamura. So a dedication ceremony was held in 2005 for the phase three. And this is our president, Tom Yanigahara, who, recently, who passed away, um, did the breaking of the drum, a sake drum. So groundbreaking was held in 2010 and then construction began in 2010. So the, the dry waterfall was assembled in October uh, during the Inter International Symposium of Japanese Gardens. So probably a lot of you were there and probably participated in the placing of the, the stones. Um, around um, spring in 2013, the same donor, Dr. Inamori, Inamori, uh, Dr. Kazuo Inamori from Kyocera, gave us $3 million to complete the lower canyon and specifically the pavilion and the kitchen building. So we had the construction going on for that year. So this is a, the construction project was a big deal in Bobo Park. Even the mayor came, the media came. So they highlighted our expansion project during that time. But this is the mayor, um, Faulkner. Um, so then we have our grand opening in 2015. So grand opening was held. Uh, we invited dignitaries. We had uh, the county, uh, council member, council general, and the county supervisor, even Dr. Namori doing the ribbon cutting. And then of course the usual, the, the breaking of the sake drum. So the completion of the phase three includes the Inamora pavilion, and then the water stream, and the cherry and the and the cherry grow. So since the opening of the last uh, the phase three, we have over 260 visitors every year. Um, so for for the past five years, we continue to promote the U.S. Japan relationship through our educational and uh, cultural cultural programs. So our programs include a variety of traditional Japanese arts and culture, and then we offer summer camps, um, school outreach, um, art exhibits, uh, festivals, uh, seminars, and then we also um, offer wellness programs such as yoga, meditation, path to wellness. Um, and so a lot more in composting. Um, and we're also happy to announce we received our museum accreditation in 2020 during the pandemic um, by the uh, American Alliance of Museum. So 
I want to say that our festival is probably the biggest event we hold every year. So we receive about 15,000 people during our festival. So this is just one of the photo of the people enjoying the cherry trees. So this is the Inamori Pavilion in, inside building. Uh, this building is used for, it's a multi-purpose building. So we hold exhibitions here, um, events, weddings, a lot of weddings held here. Um, when we first opened the exhibition, we invi invited a famous artist in Japan, Ichiro y Yamamoto, to do an exhibition of his platinum glaze ceramics um, uh, in 2015. And so, of course, we hold our annual cultural events, including the Shijin Shiki every year. So, so the garden, we do a lot of weddings. It's, it's just one of our main source of income. Um, so uh, the, especially the lower garden. So uh, yeah, every year we probably have about 60 to 80 weddings at the garden. Another source of income, we have a cafe and um, a gift shop. So looking back history, in addition to the cultural programs, we continue to reinforce the bridge of friendship um, the U.S. through gift and acquisition of objects from Japan. So in 2014, we were one of the recipients of the A-bomb survivor trees from Hiroshima. The saplings were planted around the garden to remind people of the long-standing history of the U.S.-Japan relationship. And um, recently, in February 2020, we unveiled our new outdoor exhibit, which features a 300-year-old bronze uh, canon botsatsu, one of the oldest and largest of its kind entering the U.S. So the gift was acquired through a collector from Mississippi, and um, the statue originated from Kamakura, Japan. And um, with that, I'm going to hand it over to Marissa. Thank you. Thank you, Luann. Next, we will hear from Kim Andrews. Kim is the executive director of Japan America Society of Greater Philadelphia. As executive director, she administers Shofuso Japanese Cultural Center, oversees the annual Philadelphia Subaru Cherry Blossom Festival, leads the US-Japan Business and Public Policy Series, and directs JASGP's additional Japanese arts, business, and cultural education programs. She holds a BA in art history and French from Temple University, and an MA in preventative conservation from Northumbria University in Newcastle in the UK, and a certificate in nonprofit management from the Nonprofit Center at LaSalle University. A lifelong Philadelphian who was previously a preservation consultant to over 50 cultural heritage organizations, Kim is a founding board member and a former president of NAJGA. She currently serves on the board of the Business Association of West Parkside. Welcome, Kim. And hi, everybody. I'm super happy to be here, and I'm really excited to talk about this. I, I loved watching uh, Luann's presentation, um, and you'll see so many parallels. I mean, this is the, the topic is post-war gardens, friendship gardens, so there are parallels, but we all have such different stories, and I, you know, I, I love this field because it's so interesting. Um, so I'm Kim Andrews. I've been the executive director at Shifuso since 2010. Uh, and uh, we, when I started, we had about 10,000 visitors. Our budget was $150,000. Um, and there were, it, was, I, it was me and one other guy, and I fired that other guy. <laughs> and we built the, the organization up through a merger. Um, last year, our budget was uh, over a million and a half dollars. Um, in 2019, we had almost over 45,000 visitors to Shifuso, and our organization served 70,000 people. Um, and we, you know, we, we just do a, such a better job of fulfilling our mission, which is the, the entire goal of what we do in the, in the nonprofit world and in the garden world. So this is our beautiful Shifuso Japanese house and garden. It's a traditional style Japanese house. It represents Japanese culture in Philadelphia from 1876 to present day. Um, and we really are the physical embodiment of friendship between Philadelphia and Japan. Uh, my organization, the Japan America Society of Greater Philadelphia, uh, our mission is to connect Japan and Philadelphia and Shifuso is really the centerpiece for that. Philadelphia has been um, the beneficiary of, of so many gifts from Japan over the years. And I'll show you how that plays out right at our site. That's why we are like very, um, 
we are a Japanese site, even though we're on the East Coast, we're far away from Japan. <laughs> There's not a, a large Japanese heritage community in the Philadelphia region, uh, but we've maintained our, our, our contacts back to Japan and we've maintained um, the, the really valuable relationships that we have through art, business, culture, and then our, our you know, uh, through government and, and public policy contacts too. It's quite wonderful. Um, we are not a friendship garden. We were not uh, started as a friendship garden. Uh, in fact, when uh, Shifuso came to Philadelphia in 1957-58, Philadelphia didn't have a sister uh, city in Japan. 35 years ago, uh, Philadelphia and Kobe uh, became sister gardens. Uh, Kobe already was sister garden, uh, excuse me, sister cities. Kobe already was sister city with Seattle. So we were kind of like the minor little sister. Um, but uh, we, we built that relationship up over the years. Uh, and the, the connections between Japan and greater Philadelphia go back to 1876 and, and before that to the first Japanese embassy that came to um, the United States in 1860. And then there, there have been so many connections in art, business, culture, and in academics, and especially in women's education. Um, so um, Sudo Umeko, who uh, started um, Sudo University in, in, in Tokyo, was so important in developing education for women in Japan. She was educated here in Philadelphia and Bryn Mawr and maintained long contact, uh, long relationship with, with the people that she knew here going back and forth. In fact, Bryn Mawr, Bryn Mawr College considers her one of the most important um, um, figures in Bryn Mawr's history. So going back to 1876, the first Japanese garden in North America was at our site, believe it or not, uh, in West Fairmount Park. Uh, there were two structures that were built for the World's Fair. You can see on the left, a Japanese bazaar, and then another building, a Japanese dwelling. Um, the Japanese bazaar was what it sounds like. It was a, a store and a, a garden, more or less a commercial garden was put in place, but it was a, a Japanese garden. So this was Japan's really first big foray out into the world of um, world fairs and international expositions. Um, so these two structures were built and uh, the Japanese bazaar was was filled with mostly export goods. Uh, it was a store. Japan had a really important exhibition, uh, an art exhibition that was in the, the art gallery and other areas throughout uh, the, the World's Fair. But here at the Japanese Bazaar, their little ceramics were sold and um, it was a, a, a place to find uh, for, for Americans who had never really seen or known about Japan before that, a chance to, to see some uh, pieces that they could purchase for themselves in their own homes. This is a, a super awesome uh, uh, drawing from uh, Harper's Bazaar. So this is that Japanese bazaar, that Japanese store. And you can see uh, there's a lot of stuff in that garden. Um, there's there's um, bronze cranes. And actually there's still a couple of these cranes nearby, near Shifuso and um, lanterns and all sorts of stuff. So it, it was probably not the most elegant or um, accurate representation of traditional uh, Japanese garden design, but it gave uh, Americans uh, and, and Westerners a taste of what Japanese art and design and culture was. Uh, and it really piqued an interest in the, in the 19th century for finding out more about Japan. So in Philadelphia, this, this structure was there, the garden was there, the structure was sold after the exhibition was closed, after the World's Fair closed. It's not clear what happened to it. I, in the record, some guy who lives on Pine Street bought it and then it just disappears in pieces. Uh, but the garden remained and it went fallow. Um, some of these pieces remained and they moved around the city and there was a, um, in particular, there was one lantern that actually still still exists near Shifuso. It's in the woods near Shifuso. But this was remembered in Philadelphia as his garden was. That's where the Japanese structure was. So around the turn of the century, um, another structure came to this site. So the, the, this is really proximate right next to the, where that first garden was. Um, this was a Neoman gate, a Buddhist temple gate that was brought from the St. Louis World's Fair that had been part of the Japanese exposition there. We've got a lot of World's Fair connections. Um, so this was a couple of uh, wealthy Philadelphians uh, bought this and brought this here, installed it there. And that was in, in 1909, but before, even before that, there was a, a Japanese garden that was installed there. These same wealthy Philadelphians, they, they got their own taste of Japonisma in uh, maybe going to the Brooklyn Botanic Garden, uh, maybe going to one of these world's fairs. But a Japanese landscape uh, builder named Y, the initial Y, Muto, came to Philadelphia, designed 
a garden for this location and then designed another garden or two for the, the wealthy individuals that brought him here. And then this came and this, this site in Philadelphia, again, Philadelphia, if you think of it as a provincial place, not a lot's going on, but we do have these long connections. So Philadelphians love this. It was a really popular tourist spot. Um, you can see on the left there, there's a, a lady in a long coat and a, a a big car and you go on eBay and you can find postcards of, and, and pictures of, of people standing in front of this. Philadelphians love to come out. This itself was an art piece, the, an art object itself. And the nearby Philadelphia Museum of Art at the time it slowly acquired all of the art objects that were in there. The Neoman, uh, the temple guards were in there and, and other there were, there were a couple of guardian lions and other objects that went away. And there were stairs to the second floor that were removed so that People didn't get into trouble up on the second floor, but it was essentially unguarded in the park, but very popular. Um, and it, it remained there as a popular site um, until 1955. It had been restored. Uh, the Temple Gate itself had been restored during the Work Progress Administration. Um, and it, it caught fire in 1955, not because of, um, well, overt vandalism, not because of, of uh, per, uh, intended arson. It made it through World War II, unlike many other um, Japanese structures and sites across the United States. It was being restored again in 1955, and some kids, the, the little newspaper article, some kids got inside, they were smoking cigarettes, and a pile of rags caught on fire. And so it burned to the ground, which is terrible. This is a beautiful art object. But it left a flat space and a Japanese garden, and in Philadelphia's memory, that was a Japanese site. Um, so meanwhile, in New York, <laughs> um, Shafuso's post-war origins. Shafuso itself um, wasn't original to our site. It wasn't original to West Philadelphia. It was um, it was in intended, and it was it was first an exhibit at the Museum of Modern Art in New York in Manhattan. So it was conceived as one of three pieces of architecture in a, an exhibition called House in the Museum Garden that were intended to show. Um, either examples of or influences on uh, mid-century American architecture. So the first structure was a Marcel Breuer house, um, a small little kind of uh, post Bauhaus kind of structure that is actually at the, the Pocanico Hills, the Rockefeller estate. Now they sawed it in half and moved it up there. Um, the second house was by an architect named um, Gregory Ames, who was a California, um, family architect in, in that kind of classic mid-century California style. And then the third structure was Shafuso. Shafuso had been um, conceived originally uh, that a couple of people inside uh, the Museum of Modern Art were thinking that Japanese, a Japanese structure would be a good example of influences on contemporary American architecture um, with qualities like flexible space, sliding doors, using the indoors as the outdoors, verandas are part of the living space, the garden is something to be viewed. Um, so these were the qualities that have been uh, co-opted by mid-century modernism in the United States that, that that a Japanese architecture um, pulled together. So the idea was to to build a, a Japanese house and, and bring it to bring it to New York and Manhattan. Um, Philip Johnson was the Museum of Modern Art. Arts Director of the Department of Architecture. Arthur Drexler was with the Museum of Modern Art. And then John D. Rockefeller, who was a big funder of the Museum of Modern Art, um, he kind of had the final nudge where he was uh, you know, heavily involved in business in Japan. And he had been visited by a, um, the president of the Mainichi um, newspaper at one point in New York. And so John D. Rockefeller put his whole heft behind it. And, and so the third house was going to be a Japanese house. Um, Shafuso, it, 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 was, it was built as an exhibition house. So it actually has um, three, four different styles of architecture um, all connected. So we, we have to interpret Shafuso to explain that it's an exhibition house. It, it's not a house anyone lived in. But the main building was based on uh, Kojoin um, in Miidata uh, Temple complex in, in Kyoto. So although nothing about Shafuso is exactly taken from, um, from any specific pieces of architecture or even any particular pieces of landscape design, that there were many influences on Shafuso's both architecture and garden design. Uh, the architect who was chosen was Junzo Yoshimura, uh, who was a mid-century modernist. And then the landscape architect was Tensai Sano, who was an early mid-century kind of modernist. He also designed a garden at the um, International House of Tokyo. If you, if you ever stay there, that was, uh, excuse me, that was a peer of Tensai Sano, uh, but it was from the same time period. 
Um, so Shifuso had been was was constructed in Nara, Japan, and it was funded by the Japanese government. Um, it the uh, America Japan Society of Tokyo was the the front facing organization that collected the money, and it was presented a, as a gift to the American people. So this is in the the post war years when Japan had just regained its sovereignty. So this was like an amazing gift, a super expensive gift to really demonstrate the finest points of Japanese traditional architecture for Americans as a as a gesture of friendship. Uh, of the, the United States agreed to pay for transportation of the structure, transportation of the, the work crews, and all the construction costs uh, in New York. Um, so Shafuso came to, Mo to, to MoMA. So there it is in Manhattan, uh, left and right. That, that picture on the right just blows my mind because uh, we are in a much more pastoral setting now. Uh, but while the Shafuso was at, at um, MoMA, a quarter million people went through it. It was on the cover of House Beautiful, um, Architectural Digest. And it really was a huge influence on mid-century modern design. And I'll tell you a little bit about, more about that um, shortly. Um, so here's some more beautiful pictures of Shafuso at MoMA. So uh, after the exhibition was over, Shafuso was exhibited there from uh, 1953 and 1954. It was put into storage. Um, and no plan to remain for what to do with it. Well, meanwhile, here in Philadelphia, as you heard, we had a, a nice flat spot, a traditionally Japanese location, and a, a pond and garden that already existed and, and was really solidified in the, in the minds of everybody from Philadelphia as a, as a Japanese location. So our fancy people teamed up with John D. Rockefeller and Shafuso came to Philadelphia, 1957 and 1958. It was installed and, that's, and, and our garden was installed by Tan Saisano. Um, there it is, a baby garden with a new house. So Shafuso, it, it was very popular in Philadelphia, but it was not cared for properly, as you can imagine. Uh, it's owned by the city of Philadelphia. It, it was maintained by Philadelphia Parks and Rec. And uh, I'm sure some of you on this call have um, had municipal gardens that you've had to transform into having friends groups to care for them and, and, uh, or otherwise um, try to provide extra care for, for municipal gardens. because general horticulturalists don't know how to give the care that Japanese gardens require. So Shifuso immediately started becoming overgrown. Um, there it is on the left, uh, but lots of people came through it, uh, but it was unguarded. So people also had picnics on the veranda and it was a make out place. Um, so it was a real friendship house there, I guess. But um, eventually coming up on the bicentennial, um, Philadelphia's big spotlight, the uh, Japanese government uh, realized that Shibuso had not been cared for properly. Um, so the, the Japanese government paid for a, a big renovation to bring Shibuso back to a better, better condition. So there it is during the bicentennial. Our great mayor, <laughs> Frank Rizzo, vowed that nothing would ever happen to Shibuso again, but it immediately started falling into disrepair. Um, but starting around 1978, a friends group formed, and this is really where um, the community of Shibuso uh, came into play. Um, so it was originally Japanese Americans, other interested Philadelphians, who just started, you know, loosely coming to Shibuso. It was a little, uh, little community gathering on the left. Um, Taiko Sensei, who was uh, until she just retired and moved back to Japan, finally, um, was our. our but a Senke tea master here in Philadelphia. Eventually, this is her as a, as a young woman. Um, so this was this started building a community and programming Shafuso. So Shafuso is an opportunity for Philadelphians to to really experience um, a slice of Japanese culture that they that are around here, especially you, you really can't get anywhere. And, and not a lot of Philadelphians travel to Japan. It's very far away. I can testify. Um, so this was really a chance for for something new and special and the house needed care and the garden needed special care. So this friends group came together. Um, it eventually incorporated in 1982 uh, and got its nonprofit status in 1984 and eventually hired me. Um, and so the first big project they did in 1999, that entire roof needed to be replaced. And this was a good example of, of um, the friends group really starting to reach back to Japan. The expertise wasn't really, uh, it clearly isn't here in the United States and not in Philadelphia. So uh, the, the friends group had to raise, it was $1.2 million, a lot, lot of money with a tiny little group at the time. They raised that money. They brought a, a crew of roofers, not, this is a Honoki bark roof. There are not many roofers in Japan who can even touch it. So this was a huge thing. And this helped the organization coalesce together and it helped the Philadelphia to understand the importance and significance of the site. 
Um, the friends group, uh, there were, we finally had a paid executive director so we could formalize our practice. And then in 2007, Haroshi Senju, um, who's a um, well-known Japanese artist who practices actually out of, out of New York on Long Island, he lives there, but he's also at the um, Kyoto University of Art. I think I got that backwards. He came to Shafuso to, um, to visit and there had been a series of Susuma paintings by his master and they had been destroyed actually in a vandalism incident. So he was committed to, to creating a set of paintings for Shafuso. So this is just another big gift. So Philadelphia had this gift of the, the Japanese Bazaar and Garden in 1876. Um, then in uh, 1904 and then 1909, we had practitioners come and, and the Buddhist temple gate come to Philadelphia. And then Shafuso, a gift to the American people came to Philadelphia. Um, and then here we have Hiroshi Senju creating paintings for us. Uh, which are just beautiful. Um, they're again at, at Kojoe, and this is our connection back and forth. Um, has has similar paintings um, in one of the uh, state houses there. Um, we have to keep restoring the roof, so this keeps us closely connected to Japan. We've done a, 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 over the years, um, and actually, let me let me jump in. In 2010, I was hired as executive director, uh, and I'm a preservation person. So prior to my being hired. I had, um, uh, the, the architecture was important to the organization, but we weren't promoting the garden. And I kind of identified how important the garden was. And then in, in one of those, I, I think he's on, on this right now, um, Ken and um, Kumiko Brown came to visit me. And it might've been 2010 to tell me that Nachka was forming to, to really kind of put Shafuso in a bigger context for me as a practitioner so I could see how important Shafuso is um, to, to the history of Japanese gardens in North America, not just, you know, as a Philadelphia, I'm like, this is great. Everyone should know about this here. But it has a, a bigger, uh, a bigger context and, and a, a more important meaning than I had that I had imagined. So that that Ken, thank you so much for coming and visiting and, and um, Kuniko, because you really changed um, the trajectory of Shafuso and, and the trajectory of me as the leader. Um, so we had to keep doing roof restoration. Uh, we were able to restore, there were two, two remaining, uh, two of the four remaining buildings from the Centennial Exposition. We got possession of through Fairmont Park. We pay a dollar a year for them and we restored them. So this is our connection again, back to the Centennial Exposition. They were bathrooms. Um, but one is a lovely classroom now and the other is a storage space. So these are nearby. We don't have much facility there. We have a 1.2 acre garden with a pond and a small guard house. And that's the only facilities we have. Uh, we take the, uh, especially after my involvement with Najka and, and Ken's visit, um, looking at the, our landscape as a historic landscape and realizing how important it was that 1957 garden at Tansaisano is an important landscape designer that this garden was designed for our location. It was designed for the house. It's um, unique to our space. It's not bringing qualities or, or characteristics of other gardens from Japan. It, it's a uniquely designed space that, that's very special and has its own um, very um, uh, enveloping quality. It's, it's, um, uh, I think it's remarkable. Um, in 2016, uh, <laughs> To, to solidify our hold on the market in Philadelphia, um, we merged with the Japan America Society of Greater Philadelphia. So we became the first uh, Japan America Society connected with a garden. Um, and that created, you can see this is a very corporate board here. Um, this was many of our first board members. So it, there was some struggle, uh, the struggles of merger and getting things right size. But this is how we came into um, overseeing the the Subaru Cherry Blossom Festival too. And it made things simpler for the city of Philadelphia to have one art business cultural organization with Shafuso as the center. People could kind of understand what we were doing then. Last year, tying back to this post-war period, um, we got a big grant, even in the pandemic year, and we did a magnificent if I do say so myself, exhibition uh, called Shifuso and Modernism Mid-Century Collaboration Between Japan and Philadelphia. Um, so our architect, Junzo Yoshimura, was close friends with George Nakashima, the furniture designer, a, a Japanese-American um, who was from Washington State originally. His family was imprisoned in concentration camps, and then they um, ended up in New Hope, Pennsylvania nearby. And then uh, an architect and designer couple, Noemi and Antonin Raymond, um, who were Czech and French originally, but they were American and they practiced in Tokyo. So these, the, these, you know, these three entities, the Raymonds, 
Junta Yoshimoto and George Nakashima created this creative and intellectual um, triangle that kind of ranged from, um, from Tokyo to Bucks County in Philadelphia. And uh, the, a lot of the work that they did actually really helped inform mid-century modernism that's you know, still being influential today. And I'm gonna put the link, we made a great documentary that I'm gonna put a link to, into, in the um, chat for everybody. And then just to move it along, beautiful, beautiful. So we had an exhibition um, with objects from Nakashima, the Raymonds, and then Junzo Yoshimoto. Uh, and then for during, as part of this, we actually um, asked, um, Tomoki Kato to come and consult with us. He had never come to Shifuso before. Um, he's, of, of course, a, a practitioner and academic in Kyoto with Oeya Kato um, Landscape Maintenance. And he was a big confidence booster that Sandy um, Polyakov on the left. Kato Sensei's interpretation and research demonstrated that he believed that Tansai Sano had uh, looked at, at drawings of a 1700 garden from Kojoin. So that Kato Sensei was able to kind of link some of that waterfall feature that you can see in the distance there off to the right is, is very, very similar to um, some features of, of Kojuin's uh, 1700 garden. Um, so he made that link. And then he also kind of, he, he gave us permission that we are the, we are the ones, who, we are the hands, the, the authorship of the garden in present day, that we look at the 18, excuse me, at the 1957 and 58 garden plan as our inspiration, but that Sandy in particular, he's the hand of the garden today, um, and that his authorship um, and artistry is going to be part of the garden going forward, which gave Sandy a lot of um, confidence, and my confidence was already in Sandy, to, to a, a to put, excuse me, install a pebble beach that had never been installed. It was on a plan that Sandy and I dug out of our ancient distant archives from 18, from 1957. Um, and so we, he and we, he installed a pebble beach feature. We got a permission during the pandemic. He and his garden assistant were able to keep working to install this really magnificent pebble beach that of course, as I'm sure most of you know, is, is a, an Edo style, um, feature that's at Katsura Imperial Villa and it's supposed to echo the, um, the, the stones and the edges of the Kamo River in Kyoto. Um, so there's a, a short documentary that I'll put the link in. Um, so next we're, we're looking to restore our landscape and really look at that original um, plan and intentions and, um, and try to hew back to what Tansai Sano's intentions were with, with Sandy's hand. Um, and we keep connecting back to Japan. Um, we've got um, programming that happens around our cherry blossom viewing, no big festival this year, but uh, we're looking forward to the cherry trees. So Shofuso, our, it is our connection back to Japan, back to connecting Japan and Philadelphia. And it really is for us in, in, on the, the East Coast in Philadelphia that, that post-war mid-century modern connection, even though it's a traditional Japanese site. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Our last presenter is Jessa Gardner. Jessa is the cultural programs manager for the Seattle Japanese Garden. She has spent the last five years creating new programs and managing community outreach for the garden. She has a BA in political science from Kalamazoo College and a minor in Japanese. She spent a year studying abroad in Miyazaki, Japan and still dreams of eating Miyazaki mangos. Welcome, Jessa. Thank you so much, Marisa. And thank you, Luann and Kim. I really feel honored to be uh, counted among these women in this group. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And here we go. So I'm the, as Marisa just said, I'm the cultural programs manager for the Seattle Japanese Garden, which was built in uh, 1959, technically, but opened to the public in 1960. Um, and you're going to hear some familiar themes from Luann and Kim's presentations because long before the first tree was planted in the garden or the first stone was set, there was so much work that went into uh, creating the Seattle Japanese Garden and creating conditions that the Seattle Japanese Garden could grow out of. This is a beautiful view of the garden in fall, by the way. I'm very fond of this picture. 
1904, the boundaries of the Washington Park Arboretum were designated. And this is important because the Seattle Japanese Garden is situated inside the Washington Park Arboretum. It's a 230 acre public park and we're a little four acre garden, not quite four acre garden inside of it. Uh, with a boundary and an entry gate. Uh, the park itself is open to the public 365 uh, five days a year. Uh, in 1909, the Alaska Yukon Pacific Exposition introduced Seattle to the idea of a Japanese garden. This exhibit was extremely popular. Many people came to see it and it really sparked uh, the creativity and imagination of Seattle in imagining what could be in our space. Then in 1935, the Arboretum Foundation, which is the support organization for the Washington Park Arboretum and the Seattle Japanese Garden was established. I actually work for the Arboretum Foundation and we partner with the city of Seattle, uh, which owns the land and does maintenance and cashiering for the garden. And we work with them to maintain the garden. In 1936, the Seattle Garden Club hired the Olmsted Brothers of Brookline, Massachusetts to design the Washington Park Arboretum. So Olmsted Brothers, that's a famous name in landscaping. You probably recognize it. Uh, and they really transformed the Washington Park Arboretum and made it what it is today. And part of what it is, is the Seattle Japanese Garden. In 1937, on the heels of that design, the Arboretum Foundation invited the International Cultural Society of Japan to create a Japanese style garden within the Arboretum. And the Consul General of Japan in Seattle at the time, Isaku Okamoto, took a tour of the site with Arboretum Foundation officials. So you can see him in this picture uh, with his very fashionable round glasses and his young daughter in front of him, uh, along with some Arboretum officials, and they're touring the site. This actually, this uh, site called Foster Island was not where the Japanese garden was later built because as I'm sure you can expect, World War II happened. And that really took the idea of a Seattle Japanese garden and took it off the table for many years. So, um, after World War II, many years after, in fact, we're doing a 20 year time jump, uh, there was a second attempt to create a Japanese garden. Much of the energy behind the creation of our garden can be attributed to Arboretum Foundation Special Projects Committee Head, Emily Haig. Uh, and her, after her appointment to her position in 1957, plans for the creation of the garden moved swiftly forward. And in 1958, a request for a garden was penned to the Consulate General of Japan in Seattle. And this request made its way from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to Tokyo Metropolitan Parks, where it landed in the hands of an eminently qualified design team. You can see in this picture, this is actually the groundbreaking for the tea house for the garden. Uh, and Emily Haig in her hat and her skirt is there along with many other officials from the city who participated in creation of the garden. The garden design team is really, this is what makes the Seattle Japanese Garden a special place, is the people who designed it and the people who built it. Uh, here I have pictured Kiyoshi Inoshita, Nobumasa Kitamura, and Juki Ida. So Kiyoshi Inoshita was actually retired from the Tokyo Metropolitan Parks Department, but he was an extremely well-respected landscape designer. And, um, one of his kohai, one of his mentees, was actually working with Parks at the time and asked him to come back in order to help with creation of the Seattle Japanese Garden. So he worked with Nobumasa Kitamura uh, and they brought on independent landscape designer Juki Ida. And we talk a lot about Juki Ida uh, and we're very proud to have one of Juki Ida's landscape designs as our garden. Uh, he's also a very well-respected uh, landscape architect who most of his gardens no longer exist and were one of the remaining complete gardens, a uh, few remaining in the world. Not pictured on this design team are Iwao Ishikawa, Sanetomo Ueno, uh, Chikara Ito, and Tatsuo Moriwaki. 
uh, who all also were part of the design team or the team that created the garden. And they made a 37 page design plan all without seeing the landscape in person. They did the design work from Tokyo based on pictures and schematics that had been sent to them. And they created this plan. Uh, and we're lucky enough to still have some pages from this original 1959 design plan that they created on site at our garden. And this is a, a high resolution digital scan we were able to take a few years ago. And if you walk through the garden today and you had this plan in your hands, you really could identify the landscape based on this initial draft. They were very true to the heart of this design and very little of it has been changed in the 60 years that the garden has been in existence. One thing, uh, there's a quote that really struck me as I've been doing research over my tenure at the garden about our history is this quote from Juki Ida. When I was asked to assist in this project, two points struck me. First, how could rocks, plants, and other materials for a large scale Japanese garden be obtained outside of Japan? Second, how could people of European descent and second generation gardeners of Japanese descent build such a garden. Never having experienced such a project and thinking it could be a great opportunity to learn, I was happy to undertake the work. And this really struck me because as a garden professional, I feel like we are still having these conversations about what it means to be a Japanese garden outside of Japan. Uh, and I really hope that Juki Ida was happy with the answer he found after the construction of the Seattle Japanese Garden. The picture on the left here, you can see uh, construction in progress as they were digging out the pond and you can see the completed tea house uh, as they built the garden around it. So part of the answer to Juki Ida's question is actually the design team that he oversaw when he came to the United States to actually construct the garden. Um, he worked with James Fukuda, who you can see, oh, well, he's on the far right of your screen pictured with Juki Ida standing by a lantern. So James Fukuda was uh, Juki Ida's translator and also one of the major people who really uh, pushed forward the concept of the Seattle Japanese Garden and worked with officials in the United States and, or in Seattle and in Tokyo to bring about the creation of the garden. So uh, Mr. Ida, he came in and he was asked to project manage for the creation of the garden. He was asked to hire contractors and all these things. And uh, he very much didn't feel very qualified to do so because he didn't know any of these contractors here in Seattle. So he and James Fukuda hired uh, Dick and Bill Yamasaki for stone setting. They're pictured in this middle picture uh, setting down the stones for our Suhama. Uh, they hired William Yorozu, the Yorozu company, as the general contractor to put in all the plants and not pictured are Kei and Saad Ishimitsu who were hired to do carpentry. So all of these second generation um, Japanese American men came in and they were the people who were hired to create this garden and it was really uh, this incredible learning experience by all accounts for all of these people uh, to discover what it means to create a garden, <laughs> a Japanese garden outside of Japan. So here's a photo from, oh, oh, sorry. Well, there was a photo from the opening. Let me see if I can go back a slide. Here's a photo from the opening of the Japanese garden in 1960. Uh, also in 1960, we were honored by an imperial uh, visit from the then crown prince and princess and now emperor and empress emeritus. They came October 5th, 1960 and planted two trees in the garden. The white birch tree that you see pictured that the empress is, uh, is planting here is actually still in the garden. Uh, we're lucky enough that Juki Ida actually, he was able to re return to visit the Seattle Japanese Garden. One thing he said to us as he was leaving uh, 
was that, you know, even though the garden was built and it had opened to the public, he said, it's not complete yet. You have to wait 10 years and in 10 years it will be complete. And 13 years later, he was able to come back and see the garden. I think complete probably wouldn't be the word that he used even then, because when is the Japanese garden completed? Um, but he came back and he was able to see the garden after it had matured. Uh, unfortunately, I think he wasn't very pleased with the quality of the pruning at the time, because while he visited, he actually conducted a pruning workshop and he gave very explicit instructions as to how the garden was to be cared for. So since then, we've worked harder to live up to his uh, eminent advice. Now in the garden, we're really focused on renovation and renewal. We want to maintain the integrity of this design that we have, this uh, beautiful stroll garden space, uh, while also doing the things that we sometimes have to do to modernize it, such as putting in ADA accessible trails. But we really seek to honor the spirit of the original plans. Here's some photos of the garden through the seasons. Um, we do all sorts of fantastic programming. Now, I saw a question earlier about the number of people who visit our garden each year. And in 2019, we had over 125,000 visitors, which was our biggest crowd yet. Um, here's the garden in summer, in fall, and we're not open to the public in winter, but our senior gardener a couple of years ago got this incredibly beautiful picture one morning after uh, the snowfall. The snow had just fallen during the night and he came in the next morning to do maintenance and he got this picture. So this is a view of the garden that very few people have ever seen. You can see just based on all of these snowy icy paths why we have to close in winter every year. That would not be safe to walk on at all. Um, so 2020 was the 60th anniversary of the Seattle Japanese Garden, our Kanveki anniversary. It's kind of a weird year for that. And we made a lot of plans and then we remade a lot of plans. One thing I'm really proud of from our 60th anniversary year was this collaboration with Green Legacy Hiroshima. They sent us a set of seeds from plants that survived the atomic bombing of Hiroshima. And we were able to also receive a small ginkgo tree, which we planted just outside the garden. And you can see here actually is um, our mayor of Seattle, the executive director of the Arboretum Foundation and uh, a volunteer all as well from the Arboretum Foundation and the Seattle Japanese Garden and the consul general and his wife. He had just arrived during the pandemic to Seattle. And this is one of the first things that he did in the city masked and socially distanced, of course. I also uh, am very, very proud to say that in 2020, we received the foreign minister's commendation from the foreign ministry uh, of Japan, honoring the uh, legacy of friendship and the work that we do to maintain and build understanding between Japan and Seattle. So that was another really landmark thing that happened last year. Um, there's so much more that I could say about the garden. This is such a small subset of our history. I'm sure I've gone over the amount of time that I was supposed to spend. Uh, but there's so many more stories to tell. And I hope that I get to th the chance to tell you more of them in the future. Thank you to Shizue Porshaska and Julie Coriel, who are the volunteer archivists for the Seattle Japanese Garden, without whom I could not have done this presentation, as well as photographers Peggy Garber, Chie Ida, David Rosen, Aurora Santiago, and Nikki for sharing their beautiful work. Thank you, Jessa, and thank you to all of our presenters for sharing their gardens with us today.